Hi everyone! In this video we're going to take a look at how to work with Matchbox shaders in Scratch. You'll learn how to install the plugins and how to apply them in your composite in different ways. Matchbox is an open API Autodesk implemented for their flame finishing system. Through this API anybody can write his own effect shaders and load them into flame. Scratch version 9 has now adopted this API, so Matchbox shaders can also be used inside Scratch. There are paid versions of Matchbox shader plugins available, but there's also a community-driven resource of free shaders available at the Logic Matchbox site. Please feel encouraged to join and contribute your own shaders to logic-matchbook.org. In our example, we're going to use the freely available collection. To install it, simply download the full collection through this link and unzip the tarball once downloaded. Inside, you will find all the shaders bundled together. To make them available to Scratch, we need to either tell Scratch the location of those shaders, which can be done here, or just place them into the default folder. Let's do that for now. Note that you can also create subfolders inside the Matchbox folder in order to group your shaders and have them show up in groups in the plugin browser inside Scratch. Let's start Scratch and go to the Color of X tab with this shot. Now there's two ways of adding plugins, and as such Matchbox shaders, to a shot. Either as a layer onto the current node, or as a new node on top of the current node in the node tree. Both approaches have certain advantages. Adding plugins on a layer, you can control the shape of that layer and where in the pipeline the plugin is applied, as well as control how the plugin effect interacts with other layers. Adding it on top of the current shot as a new node makes it easier to cache the media if a plugin requires substantial processing time, while you can continue to grade on top of the cached plugin. A very important rule to remember is that if a plugin uses a temporal filter, meaning that it uses prior frames of the shot to calculate the effect on the current frame, you always need to add the plugin as a new node on top of that shot, rather than to a layer. Ok, now here we are with our green screen film Magician. So let's place him into a somewhat magical environment. I'm gonna do everything whilst the clip is playing back. Let me first add a layer to add our shader to and call it Background. Now hit the Plugins button and bring up the Plugin Browser and choose our shader of choice. I'm gonna go with the CPGP Fractal Cell Shader. To apply it to a layer, click this button here or just double click the shader or plugin. For any given plugin or node, you can find the node or plugin specific parameters in this menu and the label will change accordingly. Now let's give this some animation. Cool. This shader works great, and real time so far. Now since this is our background, let's bring our magician back to the foreground by creating a new layer. And set it to non-recursive by disabling the little R icon here on the layer. Non-recursive means that this layer will get the primary layer as its input, rather than include the effect of any layers in between. Next, let's pull a key for the green screen. Invert the key and draw a garbage mask around the talent. Let's add some more blue to him to make him blend in a bit better. Lastly, let's duplicate this layer by alt dragging it and insert another shader onto it. I'll go with Croc Digital Glitch. Very cool. This shader even has a drunk vision parameter that we can crank up. How cool is that? On a side note, two things to check if something unexpected happens. If you don't see an effect, it has likely to do with this setting here. The shader, or user, might have accidentally enabled the alpha channel for the layer front input, without actually delivering one. In those cases, just disable it to see the effect of the shader. The other thing to check is this drop-down. When you want to move your canvas, but only want the effect to follow, but not the underlying texture, you need to set this drop-down to Projected instead of Map on Canvas. 
Now let's have a look at a different example. This shot, for instance, needs denoising. Good for us, there's a quite well working denoise shader in our collection. However, if I add this one to our shot, I'm losing real time playback. My little MacBook that I'm recording this tutorial on is definitely not suited for real time denoising. Now, if I want to maintain real time playback, I need to cache the effect. However, I can only do this per node, not per layer. So let's remove this layer again and add the croc denoise shader as a new node above our current shot to our node tree. Do a quick compare. Yes, the effect is definitely noticeable. Now let's cache. Therefore we go to the media menu. Here we can set up the caching format, which I'll leave as is now and hit cache input. Once through, the input of this node, which includes the effect of the shader itself, is cached and I am back on real time. I can now add any sort of grading to my shot and continue to work on the denoised cache. If I need to change something on the source node before the denoise, I can select it here in the node tree. However, any change I would do here would obviously invalidate the cache of the shader node and I would need to recache it then. Lastly, let's have a look at a more complex setup I prepared using the Croc Light Wrap shader to create a realistic light wrap in this green screen comp. To better see what's going on, let's make the node tree view a little bigger. At the very top is the matchbox node with the Croc Light Wrap shader loaded, and there's three elements feeding into it. First, there is the comp shot with the sunset comp into the shot. However, without the light wrap, obviously. Next is the mat that I created using Scratch's own Kia. The mat tells the shader where to wrap the light around. And lastly, the background to tell the shader what actually would be behind the talent in the foreground in order to use it for the light wrap effect. Back to the top level node, which is our matchbox node. And let's take a look at the inputs menu. Here I dropped in the various elements needed for the composite by just grabbing them out of the staging area where I store all my composite elements for this shot. Now if I switch back and forth between the matchbox node and the original com, you can see the light wrap effect, which I now can tweak even further. Additionally, I now added a number of secondary grading layers to further tweak this shot as a whole. Very impressive. Two things to take away from this tutorial. First, it goes without saying that I'm not the greatest compositor, and second, you can do some pretty amazing stuff with these matchbox shaders. Hope you enjoyed watching this tutorial. Goodbye!